Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Real Review Live. I'm Hugh and Hook. I'm going to guide you through a journey through the New South Wales wine regions today. And we've got some wonderful wines lined up for you. We're going to do a eight of the 16 wine regions of New South Wales are represented here. We've got Shoalhaven Heads, um, Mudgee, the Hunter Valley, Orange, Canberra District, Hilltops, Southern Highlands and the Riverina. So really quite an interesting cross section of wines from New South Wales. And uh, they're very diverse, all of these regions. New South Wales really offers a lot of diversity. I don't know whether people in other states and certainly overseas really appreciate how much diversity New South Wales has. Um, we have vineyards, of course, from, New, from one end of New South Wales to the other, from the Queensland border down to the Victorian border. Uh, my old viticulture lecturer from Roseworthy College, Dr. Richard Smart, very world famous uh, viticulturist, was fond of saying that New South Wales down the east coast could be a carpet of vines from the Queensland border to the Victorian border one day in the future because there are so many great sites along the slopes of the Great Dividing Range from north to south. Um, and that's pretty much what we're going to cover today, almost that entire length of the state. Not quite, but almost. But of course, New South Wales was the original wine state. That's where the uh, white settlement uh, first began in, in the colony of New South Wales, what is now Sydney. Um, and the first vines that were brought to Australia were in fact on the first fleet. They brought vines which were eventually planted out at Parramatta and the first vineyards were at Parramatta. Um, and they didn't survive very well in that climate. The Hunter Valley is really the first region that was uh, an ongoing um, sustainable um, wine region, which is Australia's oldest wine region, established in the 1830s. Um, it's interesting to think that way back in that colonial era when people were exploring uh, Australia, the state of New South Wales from you know, mostly across the Great Divide, uh, the early explorers were and early settlers were encouraged to plant grape vines wherever they went even though wine was hardly a fashionable drink at the time. And the reason for that was that uh, England, where they came from, didn't have any wine. It was too cold. Um, some would say it's still too cold, but it's warming up. But they thought that New South Wales would be the vineyard of England. And so they wanted to provide wine for their drinking from New, from New South Wales. It didn't quite work out that way. Various factors, most of the wine regions uh, died out, but in the early days there were vineyards down as far as Albury now on the Murray River and up as far as New England near Inverell, uh, up near the north of the state. And those regions might have died out in the 1800s, but they've been re reinvented, replanted, rekindled um, in the 20th century, uh, beginning, I guess, with the great wine, so-called wine boom of the 1960s. So we've had wine in New South Wales for quite a long time. Um, it's the second biggest wine producing state after South Australia. Um, and you can find all styles of wine here. Um, I think we will go straight into the tasting now with that little introduction. Um, we are going to have quite a lot of interesting history here too. The first wine, in fact, is the, um, is the, is the um, New South Wales, first New South Wales is the Coolangatta Estate from, um, from the Coolangatta vineyard in uh, the Shoalhaven coast. And that wine is um, this particular bottle. It's called 2019 Coolangatta Estate Winsome Riesling 2019. Um, Winsome being a member of the family, I guess, the Bishop family, which re-established Coolangatta Estate. So I'll tell you a little bit about Coolangatta Estate before we taste the wine. Um, the, Sh the Shoalhaven coast is um, the two main towns, I guess, Nowra and, and Berry. And um, first white settlement down there was 1822, so it's quite early on. Um, there's this place, Coolangatta Estate, was a, a little self contained uh, village actually, which even had a shipbuilding yard, believe it or not, which is quite an extraordinary thing for a, uh, a little country outpost in such an early part of the the New South Wales colony. In fact, the ship that was built there called the Coolangatta um, wrecked, was wrecked at Coolangatta Heads on the Queensland-New South Wales border in 1846. And that's how Coolangatta 
the town up there got its name. And that's a link between Coolangatta Estate and the, the town of Coolangatta. But the property fell into disrepair and it wasn't until the 1950s that um, the father of the current owner, Greg Bishop, came along and he planted, uh, uh, he created a dairy farm there. And later on, Greg Bishop, who is still running the place, planted vines in the 1980s. And um, this property, Coolangatta Estate, has won many, many trophies at wine shows. It's a very successful uh, business. The wines are made by Tyrrells in the Hunter Valley, which uh, probably is no great hindrance to their wonderful quality. Um, Tyrrells, of course, are master makers of Semillon, and Coolangatta Estate is very famous for its great Semillon. Uh, it has won most of those trophies for its semion, but in recent times, the Riesling has become, been coming up very strongly. And I think the Riesling is, uh, is surprisingly good um, for uh, not much great Riesling in New South Wales. Most of it comes further south. We will find one from Mudgee, which I think is outstanding in a few minutes, but let's have a look at the cool and gather first. For some reason, I'm not getting this thing working, but it's okay. We, uh, we do ask you, meanwhile, to ask questions, and there is a facility here for asking questions. I can see there's already one question coming in. Um, but uh, moving on to the first one again, Coolangatta Estate Riesling. This is uh, 2019, so it's got nearly three years on it. Uh, sorry, nearly two years on it. Uh, just coming into its second birthday. And this wine is just starting to develop some of the toastiness that you get with uh, with these sorts of, with, with Riesling with a little age on it. So there's a lovely sort of creamy, um, almost a chalky character on the nose on the first sniff, which is quite interesting. But under that, you've got lemon zest, lemon rind, uh, lemon juice, all sorts of iterations of citrus underneath there. It's very, very interesting and aromatic, very floral kind of nose, a touch of honeysuckle, really, really attractive nose. Let's have a taste. Mm. And that wine is actually just off dry. It's not completely dry. It's sort of semi dry. Uh, it's not, uh, it's certainly not particularly sweet, but there is a touch of residual sugar there, which I think softens the wine and makes it very approachable as a youngster. But there's good acidity there well and then it cleanses the finish and it doesn't doesn't make the wine cloying it leaves you with the clean aftertaste very attractive i would just say that if you haven't got any of these wines in front of you and i hope you've got at least one of them i hope you've got something in your glass because you need to taste along with us and get in the mood of the whole thing very good so we rated that wine 91 out of 100 which is a good strong silver ribbon score um, it was rated 26 out of 50 Rieslings from New South Wales of that vintage. And um, uh, we're suggesting you should drink that from now until about the next eight years. But it would probably last longer, but certainly eight years would, uh, would see it to its best. Very attractive wine and a surprising wine. Not many people would expect uh, a wine of that quality coming down from the, the south coast of New South Wales. It's certainly not one of the famous areas, but uh, probably deserves to be much better known than it is. This wine is a $40 wine and the winemaker, Andrew Spinozzi from Tyrrells, recommends as a food match, Pad Thai. Um, ubiquitous Thai dish, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, I think that's a reasonable suggestion, um, but a wine that's got a touch of residual, residual sugar and uh, like this wine has goes very well with spicy food as well. So I can think of a lot of other Thai foods that this would go very well with apart from Pad Thai. Very good. Thank you, Andrew. And um, thank you, Cool and Getter Estate. So moving along to Robert Steen. It looks like Stein, but they pronounce it Steen. And this is from Mudgy. Mudgy is probably better known for its big, big, solid, full-bodied red wines, but they do also produce some wonderful whites. Um, the Steens have been doing it for quite a long time, and before they really started hitting the headlines, there was Miramar, where Ian McRae was doing wonderful Riesling for a long time, uh, which again uh, contradicted what some people might expect from a region that's famous for humongous Herculean red wines. So the Steen family have an interesting history. 
they um, uh, Robert Steen um, established this vineyard in um, the 60s and his grandson is now in charge. Uh, his name is Jacob and uh, Robert Steen came from Sydney to, to, um, to Mudgee and planted vines because he knew that his ancestor way back in 1838 had arrived in New South Wales from Germany as part of a group of people that the MacArthur family brought out here to look after their vineyards. Uh, the, the MacArthur's, of course, had vines and they imported cuttings of vines and they established, helped establish the wine industry in Australia. But there weren't many people here that knew anything about looking after grapevines. So the MacArthur's imported German vine dressers, as they called them, viticulturists from Germany who knew all about it. And uh, the Steen family believed that their forebear, Johann, also brought some Riesling cuttings with him. And they may well be the first Rieslings that were ever planted in Australia. So um, that was 1838, and it took a bit of a jump before they established Steen's in Mudgee. But um, Robert Steen's uh, grandson, Jacob, identifies himself on the back label of this wine, not just as the winemaker, but as a Riesling fanatic, um, which you don't often see on wine labels. He makes four Rieslings each year, which is a lot for a small family winery. And I believe his father, Andrew, said to him one day, Robert, uh, Jacob, I think we've got enough Rieslings. <laughs> he is a Riesling tragic. They have a wonderful restaurant there called the Pump House, which, which is uh, right next to the cellar door, part of the cellar door. And they grow a lot of the produce in their own gardens, which for the, for the food they serve at the Pump House. So it's really worth a visit if you go to Mudgee. Okay, let's have a taste of this Robert Steen Single Vineyard Reserve Riesling 2019. So this is their top Riesling, their reserve. And it's a wine that's built to age, and you can probably tell that as soon as you pick it up and look at it. The colour is quite pale, uh, which suggests that it's an ageing, a wine which is ageing slowly and which is destined to have a long life. So let's have a, a sniff and a taste. A very discreet nose, a very discreet nose. It's got lovely floral aromas, a bit of talc, talc talcum powder character. It's quite minerally and quite reserved. That wine is, is not showing as much aromatics as the Cool and Gatta, but this wine is slow aging. It's developing at a, at a graceful and gracious rate. It hasn't got any toastiness to it yet. That will come in time, but right now it's primary fruit and it's really quite minerally and very interesting. Let's have a taste. And that is a completely different style of Riesling. You can drink it now and enjoy it now. It would go well with food for sure, fish especially, but that wine will go on and get richer and more complex with age and really reward cellaring. So a lovely range of citrus characters on the nose, um, citrus blossoms, limes and mandarins. And um, I think that's a, a pretty smart Riesling. We scored it, um, what did we score it? 95, which is a gold ribbon score. And um, uh, it was rated a top rank wine. It was number four out of 20 2019 Rieslings from the Central Ranges, which is uh, that part of New South Wales that includes Mudgee as one of its regions. So it ranked very highly, number four out of 20. And we're suggesting that you drink that now until 2032, which is a fair way off. It's another 11 years. Um, I have no problem saying that this wine will last for a lot longer than that. Gorgeous wine indeed. Nice and dry and crisp. The food match, according to winemaker Jacob Steen, is, I'll quote him actually, like all good Rieslings, it is a perfect match to seafood, especially oysters, prawns, or super fresh sashimi. Totally agree with you, Jacob. Sashimi would, would do me right now. In fact, oysters is such a minerally crisp, uh, dry wine that oysters would be great with that. Love it. So a couple of questions. And the first question is a man with a name, an interesting surname, Mr. Fallon, Clive Fallon. I wonder if he's related to the Fallons that had vineyards in the Albury district way back in the 19th century. Uh, people I was referring to before. He says, his question is, any idea why we don't see New South Wales on many wine lists? 
Well, you've hit a sore point there, Clive. I totally agree that, uh, that there are not enough New South Wales wines on New South Wales wine lists, especially Sydney wine list. Um, there have been attempts over the years to, to do something about that. Uh, these days, the Wine List of the Year competition gives a special prize for the best uh, local wine list. So the best wine list of a restaurant which features its local wines. And I think that's a, a really good innovation. But um, there's something wrong with the mentality of people in restaurants these days. There is a lot of very, very uh, extraordinary wines that you would not expect to see in restaurants. Um, you would expect to see something that you recognise in restaurants. And I go to restaurants quite often and I recognise nothing on the wine list. And I think if someone like me doesn't recognise anything, what hope has the average punter got who doesn't taste as much wine as I do? So, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that needs rectifying. If you've got any ideas, let me know. The next question is from Craig Tukey, who says, what types of wines do Shoalhaven region make apart from Riesling? Well, I've talked about the Semion, which I think is the great wine of that region. There are a couple of other varieties down there that are interesting. Chambassan is a variety that uh, several of the vineyards grow down there. Chambassan is a red variety, which is hardly known, but it's a variety that re resists uh, humidity and resists um, the, the mold diseases that grapevines get in very humid climates. And the Shoalhaven coast is a very humid climate. So that's why they grow a lot of Chambassan down there. Um, another quick one. How does New South Wales Riesling differ from SA or WA Riesling? Um, I think you have to talk about individual wines there because they are, they are different, just like all South Australian wines are different and West Australian wines are different. Uh, I don't think you can make generalisations. In fact, in a, in a recent article in the Real Review, I was posing the question, can you tell the difference between Eden Valley and Clare Valley Rieslings? And I suspect that most, most experts would have a lot of trouble doing that because quite often they can be mistaken for each other. So, yeah, I think that um, the maker is the main guide. And there's a classic example here. This wine is made to keep and got made to go with food. And the, the other wine is made to drink now, I think. So it depends what the winemaker is trying to do. Right, yeah, moving on to the next two wines. We've got one of the great classic wine styles of Australia, which is Hunter Valley Semion. And... Uh, this is one of the great producers. I mean, when you think of Hunter Valley Semion, you probably think of Tyrrells and McWilliams Mount Pleasant and um, Brokenwood and others. This man, Andrew Thomas, did his apprenticeship at Tyrrells, as a lot of the great winemakers in, in the Hunter have done. Whoops, should go over here. Um, and he knows a thing or two about making Semion. And this is one of the great wines of the Hunter. Um, so that was Tomo, as they call him. That was his background. Um, I think he has been he he has been producing grapes uh, wines from this vineyard for a long time, but the the chance came up two years ago in um, to buy this vineyard in two thousand and nineteen. I think it was. He bought this vineyard outright from the owner um, uh, Ken Bray, who had been growing grapes since nineteen sixty nine and selling them to some of the best producers in the Hunter, including Andrew Thomas. But now he owns the vineyard, he can do what he likes with it. Presumably he's still selling some, some of the grapes. But he makes this wine called Braymore, which is his top semion every year. And he says that every year the grapes from Braymore are the best semion grapes that he ever sees for the vintage. So um, it, it's an outstanding vineyard. The thing about Braymore is it's on that strip of two kilometre long strip of sandy soil that runs along Hermitage Road uh, between Broke Road and Deasy's Road in Percolbin, for those who know the district. It's quite a discreet little area. Um, it's known as the Grand Cru of uh, the Hunter Valley. And along that strip of soil, you've got Tyrrell's HVD Vineyard, you've got Casuarina, you've got um, um, a Keith Tullock's Vineyard called the Field of Mars. And you've got um, a couple of others, uh, Trevina, um, and this wonderful vineyard, Braymore, which is uh, one of the great vineyards of the Hunter, as I've said. So every year, Andrew makes a reserve wine, which is called Cellar Reserve, and this is it, 2013 Thomas Braymore Cellar Reserve Semillon. So about 80% of his Braymore is released as a young wine, and about 20% of it is kept for further ageing, which he releases six years 
after vintage. So this wine would have been released in 2019. Um, I guess it's still available, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's the top tank. He makes several tanks. It's not wood aged at all. So he selects the best tank of Semillon that he has from Braemore every year and the one he likes the most and says, that's going to be the cellar reserve. We bottle that, we put it away for six years minimum. And the thing about this wine when you come and pick it up is that it's still got a very light yellow color with a greenish tinge to it. It's the color of a young, a much younger wine than what it is, which is, you know, eight years old now. Um, and when you sniff it, it's quite fresh again. It's starting to develop the toasty patina of an aged wine, but it is still fresh and it has lovely creamy lanolin, beeswax, um, and lemony honeyed um, uh, semihon characters. It's starting to display some of the wonderful complexity that these wines get with bottle age. It will get more and more toasty as it ages. It'll de develop some more honeyed character and some it maybe even some butteriness to it. Um, right now, I think it's just entering its peak drinking zone. So let's have a taste. The thing that amazes me about Great Hunter Semillon is that it's got a lightness to it, but an intensity to it. And the length of flavor is, is formidable. Normally you think maybe the bigger the wine, the longer the length of flavor, but no, with Semillon it's a, it's, it's a contradiction to all that. This wine has finesse, it has delicacy, it has subtlety, and it has intensity and length and persistence. Uh, it is just an amazing wine. Um, 2013 was not a great red wine year in the Hunter, but it was a very good white wine year. And this is a pretty good example of that. We scored it uh, 96 out of 100, which is a high gold ribbon score, maybe even a trophy score if you're doing a wine show. And it rated number five out of 53 semions from that vintage from the Hunter Valley. So we tasted 53 semions from 13 vintage, and this came in number five. I'd love to see what was above it. They must have been very special indeed. Um, we've said drink it now until 2028, which is only seven years hence. So I think that's a bit conservative. I think it's going to go much longer than that. It is aging very graciously, gracefully. Um, and it's a top rank wine because of its rating as number five out of 53. We did ask Andrew Thomas uh, to recommend a dish to go with it. He must have been too busy with vintage because he didn't get back to us, but I'm going to say crab sandwiches. And what I think about when I taste this is Guillaume Brahimi, who had that wonderful restaurant in the Opera House, the Benelong. He had crab sandwiches there, which were just to die for. He's now got his bistro down in George Street in, uh, in Sydney. I'm not sure if he's still doing those crab sandwiches, but I'm, I reckon he should be. <laughs> and he should be having this wine on the wine list to go with it. In fact, Guillaume is pretty good with New South Wales wines on his wine lists in my experience in the past. That is a beautiful wine. I have a great deal of trouble throwing that out, but we have to move along to the next wine. I will just point out that it's a very low alcohol wine. So it's only about 10 and percent alcohol. So if you want to, um, you can't exactly drink yourself sober, but you would um, certainly get close to it because those wines, um, uh, you can have more of that than you can have of a wine that's like 14% alcohol before you start to feel the effects. Um, so that's good for Weight Watchers as well. Moving on to red wines now. We have number one, which is the Pinot Noir. Let me see. It's the Colmar Estate Block 3 Pinot Noir 2018. I have to get my red wine plums, red wine glass out. Here we go. And... This is from Orange. So Orange is one of the more newly emerged wine regions of New South Wales. Uh, it's become a bit of a star. Uh, cool climate varieties are now in fashion and Orange is high altitude and cool climate and it does those varieties really, really well. So Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, um, it's taken a lot longer to get to make really good Pinot Noir than the other varieties. It started making really good Shiraz earlier than it made good Pinot, in my, my opinion, and even good Cabernet. But 
we're starting to see some absolutely brilliant Pinots coming out of that area now. It could be vine age, it could be the experience of the of the wine producers. I'm not sure, but this is um, this is Colmar Estate. Let me tell you a little about Colmar Estate. Um, it's on Pinnacle Road, which is right nestled under the brow of Mount Canobolus, which is the big feature mountain in the district, just outside the city of Orange. Mount Canobolus is an old extinct volcano, and a lot of the best vineyards are on the lower slopes of this mountain. The altitude of this vineyard is 980 metres, which is pretty high. Um, some of the vineyards in Orange go a little over 1,000 metres. So this is pretty close to as high as they get. The owners are Bill and Jane Shrapnel, and they bought this vineyard as an already established six, six hectare vineyard, um, first planted in 1991, and the Shrapnels bought it in 2013. So they're reasonably newcomers to the business, but would you believe the first wine they made uh, won a trophy at the local wine show, and they've been notching, notching up lots and lots of awards ever since. Um, in fact, um, in the first five years, they won 27 trophies and still counting. So they interpreted that as being an indication that they'd lucked on a pretty damn good piece of terroir. I think they're absolutely right about that. Let's taste the wine. First thing you notice is that it's a lighter color than perhaps a Shiraz or a Pinot, but it's not particularly light for a Pinot. Pinots come a lot lighter than that sometimes. So a medium full purple red color and a really good tint, very good, still youthful purple tinge to it at three years of age. Ah, and that nose. One of the things I love about Pinot Noir is the fragrance of it. And this has got a beautiful strawberry, raspberry, red cherry, and mixed herbs kind of nose. It is very fragrant, very aromatic. I think there's probably some whole bunch fermentation contributing to that complexity. It's not just a matter of simplistic cherries like some of them can be. And there's oak there, but the oak is almost, it's almost impossible to detect which it should be in Pinot Noir. You don't want oak, you don't want the smell of oak in Pinot. It's a delicate variety, can be easily um, overshadowed by too much oak. So let's, that's a beautiful nose. I could sniff that, sit and enjoy sniffing that for a long time. Let's have a taste. And yes, it is just as nice to taste as it is to smell. It's a light body, light to medium body red wine. It is, Pinot Noir is rarely full bodied uh, in Australia. It's usually lighter and more fragrant and lighter structured with less tannin than most of the bigger varieties like Shiraz, Cabernet, Malbec and so on. So the great thing about that is that you can drink it young and you get the best out of them when they're young. You don't have to age them. So the, the tannins in that wine, they're there, but they're, no, they're very fine, soft tannins. They give you just enough structure and firmness and grip to clean the finish and to go with food if you had food with it. But it doesn't need food. You can drink that by itself and it's just a delicious drink by itself. I have trouble not having a separate second sip. Mm. Mm. It's a brilliant wine. It's a block three. They do several Pinots at uh, Colmar. And I suspect that this is their top one. It's $55, which is not a particularly high price for a very good Pinot. Uh, we scored at 95 out of 100. So a gold ribbon score. Um, it's number three. It ranked as a top ranked wine. It ranked number three out of 29 Pinot Noirs from Orange of that vintage. Uh, and we say drink it now until 2030. So another eight or nine years. Should see it to, to the end of its um, peak drinking, I think. Who knows? It's a new vineyard and a new, not such a new vineyard, but this sort of wine is, it doesn't have a, a particular history that we can look back at and say, ah, that's a 20 year wine. Why bother to keep it for too long when it's so lovely now? We did ask the winemakers, of course, um, the um, uh, which are Bill and Jane Shrapnel, the owners, uh, what sort of food that they would serve with this wine. And they said duck braised in stock with capers and olives and they stipulated it must go with a savoury sauce, not a sweet sauce. And I totally agree with them there. I would love that. I think duck and Pinot Noir is pretty much a, a no-brainer anyway, but that's a very nice sounding dish, I've got to say. A couple of questions now. And um, Andrew Thomas, I'd better give Andrew Thomas the, uh, the time of day. 
before we finish, forget the semion altogether. He says the 13 vintage, which is this one, Braymore semion, is, in my humble opinion, the single best vintage I've made in 22 years of making wine from this Icon vineyard. Uh, he held it back an extra year. That's why it's uh, older than you would normally find. Uh, because it's such a good wine. Released in September 2020, so only a few months ago. There are only about 36 packs left. Get in quick, folks. <laughs> good on you, Tomo. Thanks for that little bit of advertising there. Um, and he says the 15 vintage is due for release in September this year. Okay, thanks for that. For that. Now we go back to, um, oh, these are both white wine questions too. Craig Tookie, uh, what makes a vintage a good white wine year and a red and a red, a bad wine year in the same vintage. Oh, okay. I get the drift of your question. I see, I did mention that 13 wasn't a great red year in the Hunter. It's an okay year and certainly not a bad year, but 14, which came immediately afterwards, I overshadowed it. I think it was an outstanding red year. And the previous vintage that was outstanding was 2011. So um, you don't want it to be too hot and too dry and too sunny for white varieties. You probably make your best white wines in a more mild season. And quite often in the Hunter, they can be wet seasons as well, can produce very good semions. Uh, but reds, you need dryness and you need warmth, you need sun, you need heat to produce the, and you need low yields and produce the low yields. So they're also planted on different soils in the Hunter. If you're a soil, interested in soils and go to the hunter and have a look around there because it's fascinating red soils for red grapes and white soils for white generally speaking so the sandy soils i talked about in braymore suit semion very well but if you go up to the broken back range where it's red volcanic soil that's where the red the shirazes do particularly well okay another question joe is semion typically lower alcohol then why is that if, if semion is picked too ripe, it becomes fat and blousy. It becomes flabby and it doesn't age well. To, to retain its tightness and structure and age well, it has to be picked early. But the historic region why it was picked at low alcohol was that the rains used to come and damage the vintage. And people like Murray Tyrrell would always say, oh, yes, uh, semion is the best variety for the hunter, much better than Chardonnay because you can pick it early and make great wine. With Chardonnay, you have to leave it out longer and risk the weather changing. So in a, in a nutshell, I better, that's probably enough about that. Let's move on because we've, time is at our heels. Um, it's hard to move past the Pinot Noir, but we're moving on to something more full bodied and just as interesting in my view, which is a Shiraz from the Canberra district. And this is Gundog Estate. Gundog Estate, Marksman's Shiraz. Um, a little bit about Gundog Estate. The, um, this is a man called Matt Burton, who is the winemaker and owner of Gundog. He, he and his father, in fact. His father is, uh, is Jeff Burton, who is a well-known cinematographer who's made a lot of movies. And he's obviously a wine lover. Uh, they planted vineyards and they also buy in a lot of grapes and they make wine from three regions. The Hunter, which is where they're based mainly, the Canberra district, which is where this comes from, and the Hilltops, which is out in Western New South Wales, which I'll talk about for the next one, which is the Hilltops Cabernet. They have two cellar doors, Gundog Estate. One of them is in, is in the Hunter and Hermitage Road, uh, not Hermitage Road, McDonald's Road, just, just down the road from Brokenwood. And the other one is in Gundaroo, which is part of the Canberra district. So you can buy and taste their wines in two separate regions. Um, Matt Burton has a wine science and a business administration degree or two degrees from Charles Sturt University. And he started Gundog Estate in 2011 with his dad. So it's only 10 years old. So it's made quite an impact in 10 years. Canberra District, great for Shiraz, great for a lot of things, but Clonakilla and people like that have really put the Canberra District on the map for making Shiraz. Um, of course, Conakilla blend a bit of Viognier with theirs. This one is straight Shiraz. And Mr. Burton sources his grapes from mainly from two really good vineyards in this district. And one of them is um, Phil Williams's vineyard. The other one, Phil Williams is the ABC uh, international correspondent, by the way, you've probably seen him on TV. 
So he owns a vineyard there which produces outstanding grapes. And the other one is Four Winds Vineyard, which is also in the Murrum Bateman area, and they produce excellent wine under their own label, Four Winds. So he manages to wrangle some fruit from those vineyards and turn it into a really, really good wine. So let me just taste this wine and talk about it a little bit more. It's um, the, the style of Canberra Shiraz is much more elegant than, say, the hotter areas from South Australia, Clear Valley, Barossa Valley, Matharan Vale. They're usually lighter in weight and more fragrant. The cooler the climate, the more fragrance you get, the more spiciness you get on the nose. And despite having quite hot summers, Canberra District classifies as quite a cool region. Colour is, is really good. It's got not particularly dark, uh, which is not a problem. Really dark wines I'm a bit scared of. They're quite often too extractive, but this is a, a really beautiful colour with a purple tinge to it. It's bright and fresh. And the nose is the nose has got lots and lots of dried herb aromas to it. Lovely. It's got spices. It's got uh, red fruits rather than dark fruits. Um, red tubes, uh, pastilles, if you like, um, raspberry pastilles. Gorgeous nose. I could sit and sniff that for a long time. It's a very entertaining aroma. Um, this is the Marksman Shiraz, which is his top Shiraz. It's a $70 wine, so there's not a, not a cheap wine by any stretch. Uh, but wow, is it a good wine? Let's have a taste. Mm. That is delicious. Elegant, medium to full bodied, fine tannins, not a big bash of tannins that grabs your tongue and wrings the hell out of it. No, this is a subtle wine, wine of great understated beauty, I think. Intense, long on the palate, beautiful, seamless flow to it. There are no ups and downs. It's got great line. The acidity is nice. You should never notice the acidity as being strong in a red wine, in my opinion, but you can feel the acidity is keeping this wine lively and fresh and crisp and clean on the finish. It is such a beautiful wine. I think that's an outstanding wine. Um, I wouldn't balk at $70 for that. We scored it um, 95, which is a Gold ribbon score, of course. And it rated as a top rank wine. It's uh, number five out of 66 2019 Shirazes we tasted from across New South Wales at the time uh, that snapshot was taken. Um, and we've said drink it now until 2034. So no problem. That's another 10, 12, 10 to 15 years. No problem for this wine. I think it's still youthful it's got a long future ahead of it and wow that is a beautiful one okay moving along to something a bit more gutsy cabernet when when i think about new south wales and cabernet there aren't too many regions that that make great cabernet it's not like south australia where you have several um, the great cabernets in new south wales come from probably primarily from mudgy um, there are one or two in the Hunter, but generally it's much more of a Shiraz region than Cabernet. Um, and orange is generally a bit cool for Cabernet, um, but the Hilltops is very, very good for Cabernet. And probably the first vineyard that really made a big splash with Cabernet in the Hilltops was um, Barwing. For those who have a bit of memory, Barwing's faded a bit from, from the scene, but Barwing was actually not planted by McWilliams, but it was bought by McWilliams as a mature vineyard, and I'm sure they still own it, but whether they, I don't see the Barwing Cabernet much, or the Shiraz much anymore, but I think they're still out there somewhere. So this wine is from that area, which is the Hilltops. Now the Hilltops is one of the, one of the quiet regions of New South Wales. It's centered on the, the town of Young, and Young is, um, yeah, it's south of Orange, south of Cowra, um, and it's um, quite a high altitude region and it's, it's cool enough to grow really good stone fruit. So cherries, as a, cherries are the, are the great, um, the fame of Young. Young is known as the cherry capital of New South Wales. Um, and so you find quite a lot of people who grow grapes there now have also cherries or started off with cherries. 
And that's true of the family that owns uh, this vineyard, which is the, um, uh, the Mullaney family. And the Mullaney family um, uh, have, a, have a big cherry orchard. It's one of those orchards where you can go along and pay your money and pick your own cherries and fill your buckets and take them home and get as much as you want. And while you're there, get a few bottles at the cellar door, perhaps. Um, Ballina Clash is the name of the wine. At least that's how I pronounce it. It could be Ballina Clash, but I call it Ballina Clash, which sounds more Irish because it is an Irish name. And in fact, um, Peter Mullaney, uh, his father, was brought up in a town called Ballina Clash in Ireland, and he migrated from there to Australia. So, and then Peter and his wife, Kath, uh, have this, uh, this orchard and this vineyard. And Peter's brother, Brian, also has a vineyard in the same district, and it's called Grove Estate. So they're, they're, they're quite a um, significant family in the district. The Mullaney's at Ballina Clash um, have what seems to me to be almost a unique approach to making wine. Um, they make a Cabernet in the odd years and a Shiraz in the even years. Now, this is a bit strange because this is an odd year. And, and um, they told me that a couple of years ago, so maybe they've changed their mind now, or maybe I've got it round the wrong way. But the important thing is that certainly at that stage, they were making different varieties in alternate years. And I did ask them why they do that, and they said they didn't want to overload the market. That's very quaint, isn't it? I think that's a lovely attitude. Um, let's not force too much wine on the people, just give them enough to keep them happy. So Ballina Clash Cabernet Sauvignon Tom is its name, 2019 from the Hilltops region. And the first thing you notice when you pick it up in the glass, it's wow, it's got a really deep color. Deep purple, red, crimson at the core, just, just really, really uh, an impressive color. It's not a black color or a dark, you know, an opaque color. If you have a color like that, it's a warning sign. It means it's been over-ripened or over-extracted. But the color here is a bright color. Let's have a sniff. And that just, that just smells like Cabernet. It's got cassis, it's got blackberries, black currants, it's got a lacing of crushed herbs, a little bit of leafiness to it, but certainly not enough leafiness to be um, any indication of unripe grapes. There is a bit of leafiness that is part and parcel of Cabernet character, I think. And if you think of the smell of black currants, there's certainly a, a herbal, there's certainly a greenish element to black currants. It's part of the part of the deal. Let's taste the wine. Mm, that's lovely. That's a big, powerful wine. That's a full-bodied, really gutsy wine. It's built for the long haul. That'll last for 20 years, no problem. But it's not so tannic that you can't drink it now. It's got structure. That will go with the most hearty foods that you can throw at it. So really old, hard cheeses will be great with that. Um, rare, uh, rare beef. Um, and, and rare lamb and rare venison, rare anything will go really well with that. The proteins will just soak up the tannins in the wine and you won't notice them, but they do help give it backbone to carry the flavour with, with hearty flavours. So, so meat with a demi-glaze sauce, no problem at all. We scored that wine 94 out of 100, which is a high silver ribbon, almost a gold, and it's got number four out of 70 Cabernets from across Australia. I would say this wine will last for at least another 20 years. We've said drink it from 2023 to 2039. In other words, 20 years from vintage date. I have no doubt it will last for, for longer than that, 25 years, maybe even 30. Depends how you sell it, of course. If you've got a good seller, it'll last longer. So, Bell and a Clash. We've asked um, Peter and Kath Mullaney, uh, would what they serve with it. And they said lamb shanks with gremolata served on buttermilk mash with a side of green beans. Sounds pretty good to me. I think all meats that are slow braised, long cooked, um, uh, go really well with full bodied red wines. Um, and they also go with aged red wine, I think really well. So that is a, a very, very smart Cabernet. So never say New South Wales can't do good Cabernet. 
Craig Tookie says, what is your favourite food match with an Australian cab sav? My favourite food match with an Australian cab sav. Well, I think I've just talked a bit about that. I think slow braised meats are really good. But when the wine's young and quite the tenants can be more aggressive when the wine is young, I would have it with something that's a little bit more uh, rare meat. Rare meat goes really well with young tenants. So, you know, as I said before, really you know, rare steak um, and pink lamb, that sort of thing. But aged cheeses go really well with, with Cabernet as well. And I'm thinking Comte Day, I'm thinking um, cheddar, I'm thinking, um, um, uh, you know, it's, it's gone out of my head now, but the famous uh, Italian hard cheese that you also great with Grana Padano or Reggiano, those cheeses are fantastic with, with Cabernet. Um, and Clive, says, Clive Fallon again says, if I get the 13 Braymore, how long can I keep it? I think I've already addressed that one. Clive, I'm saying that that's, that's probably at least a 20 year wine. So it's now uh, eight years old and it's still fresh as a daisy. Another 12 years will get it to 20 and it's still going to be quite youthful and vibrant then, I think. So, but, but why, keep it for, why, why keep it for any, any longer than uh, is necessary? It's better to drink wine too young than too old. It's my philosophy anyway. There's, when, you, when you open a wine that you, th you thought, oh, God, I should have opened that five years ago or 10 years ago because it's a bit past it now, it's a terrible feeling, especially if you spend a lot of money on it. So always drink them younger. A bit young, a bit too young is better than a bit too old. Um, another question, another quick question before we move on. And Bill Shrapnel, it's not really a question. Bill Shrapnel from Colmar Estate has said, Ballina Clash also makes Verb Turiga national. So thank you for that. I didn't know that Ballina Clash had any Turiga national in their vineyard, but that's of course one of the famous Portuguese grapes. And I've got um, no surprise at all that the Hilltops region would produce very good Turiga national. Okay. We're moving on now to, um, to something completely different, as Monty Python used to say, which is Rafosco. I wonder how many people have tasted a Rafosco in the audience. Um, I can only think of two other Rafoscos in Australia, apart from this one, and all three of them are made in tiny, tiny volumes. Um, Rafosco is something that um, uh, is well known in Italy but it's not well known in Australia. And, and it comes from the north of Italy, which is mainly known or famous for its white wines and not its red wines. So all of those are reasons why you probably don't have a lot of experience with Rafosco. This is Tertini Private Cellar Collection Rafosco del Peduncolo Rosso 2019. Tertini is in the Southern Highlands, which is south of Sydney. It's the it's a high altitude, cool climate and quite humid region. Mittagong, Bowral, um, those sort of areas, uh, those towns figure quite ha uh, strongly in the highlands. And this is near Mittagong, this vineyard. Tatini is the name of the property and it's owned by a man called Tatini, Julian Tatini, who made his pile in furniture, freedom furniture shops, I'm sure you've all heard of. He, used, he founded that, he doesn't own it anymore, he sold it. Um, but he established this vineyard and it's near Mittagong and being of Italian extraction, he was born and raised, I think, in Bologna. Uh, he decided that he'd like to make as many Italian varieties as he could. So they produce a range of wines called the Italian Collection. And they also have in that series an Arnaise, a Lagrine and a Corvina. And they're all Northern Italian varieties. So he's putting his... Um, you know, he's, he's, he's put his stake in the ground there with northern Italian varieties. So Rafosco is famous in the northeast of Italy, the Venetian area, Venetian zone, uh, which includes Friuli, Trentino, uh, and across the border from Friuli is Slovenia, um, where they also grow Rafosco. But there are more than one type of Rafosco, and this one is Rafosco del Peduncolo Rosso, which means that the bunch of berries, the peduncle is the stalk that holds the bunch, holds the bunch together. 
and this one has a red stalk. The peduncle is the peduncle rosso is a red stalk. <laughs> so, oh, I'm sure you you needed to know that. Um, so Rufosco, it's um, it's a variety which uh, is famous in Italy for producing dark coloured wines with huge tannins and enormous concentration and high acid as well. It can be quite a formidable wine and it's a sort of wine that really needs food. So when this first came across my desk, I was quite interested to, 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 to taste it and think how it related to the model wines which are in, in, uh, in Friuli. Uh, let's just have a taste and see what it's like. Yes, it does have a deep colour, but it's not particularly dark. It's no darker than the Cabernet from Balanaclash. It's got a lovely purple rim to it. It's bright and fresh, exactly as you would hope for a 2019 vintage, only two years old. And when I first sniff it, I smell a touch of reduction. It's got a smoky kind of sulfide character, which is just a, a high note that wafts above that wine. But it, I, think, I think if you splash that into a decanter, it would lose that quite quickly. And underneath that, there are a lot of dark fruit characters, you know, dark plums, black cherries, that sort of thing. And it's not particularly complex, but I think that's a wine which is so young at the moment, it's going to produce more interesting character if you can age it for a while. Um, it is, um, it is, is very youthful indeed. Now let's taste it, see how powerful and tannic it is, if it is at all. Mm. Well, that's pretty much the way they are. It's not forbiddingly tannic. It's got quite high acidity for a red wine, um, which you won't notice if you have it with the right sort of food, of course. But that's a wine which is fruit driven. It's bold. It's straightforward. Um, it's very generous in its flavour. Complex, you wouldn't call it complex. Not yet anyway. In the future, maybe. Uh, really good wine. I mean, the winemaker there, jo Jonathan Holgate, is a very, very good winemaker. I've got a lot of time for him. And I think that everything he turns out is good. This is a, a very, very well-made wine. Um, and I think it's going to go onwards and upwards from here. Um, that's if you can get it, there's very little made. 225 dozen were produced. So I think they've only got a few rows of, of, of um, Rafosco in the vineyard. So that's the Tatini. They've got a cork in it, but at least it's not dirty natural cork. It's a, uh, it's a DM, which is a composite cork which is guaranteed to be free of cork taint, TCA. So, and I, I'm not sure why it has a cork in it. Perhaps it's just too small a, um, a volume to be putting through the screw capper, if that was possibly an excuse. <laughs> anyway, um, a very, very good wine and a really interesting wine. And if you wanted to produce a wine that stumps people in an options game, you could produce this wine and no one would ever guess what it is. And they'd all be saying, what the hell is a Rafosco? Well, now you know. So, good stuff. Rufosco. And we're moving on now to the final wine of the event, which is a sweetie. And sweet wines really should be kept to the end of things, whether you're having a tasting or a dinner, because it's pretty hard to taste a dry wine after a sweet wine. They do tend to finish things off rather nicely, sweet wines, especially great sweet wines like this one. And believe, believe me, this is a great sweet wine. Look at that color, golden. Wow, it just says, hey, there's something special going on in this glass. Lily Pilly. Lily Pilly Estate, I think is the true name. Noble Sauvignon Blanc 2018. So very colorful little label. A lot of sweet wines come in half bottles, of course, because you don't need much, very much of them before you know, before you've had enough. Um, they're so powerful and so sweet. Lily Pilly is a, um, a great producer in the Riverina. And the Riverina in recent times has become quite famous for this, this style of wine. The Tritus affected sweet wines made from a variety of grape varieties. At Lily Pilly, they make them out of God knows how many varieties. They make them out of Semillon, that's the main one in the Riverina. And De Bortoli's Noble One, of course, is the most famous the Dryda Semillon in the Riverina, but they also make it out of Sauvignon Blanc, like this one, Musket, Gewürztraminer, Riesling, and even Chardonnay. 
and sometimes they blend them, sometimes they bottle them individually. Sometimes they're wood aged, sometimes they're not. Um, the Fumara family own Lily Pilly Estate, and they uh, are one of the many Italian families in the Riverina who are not only in the wine growing business, but in the fruit and vegetable growing business. They started off 70 odd years ago growing fruit and vegetables in Leeton or just outside Leeton. Then they created a supermarket called the Golden Apple, which was the go to place for anyone wanting to shop in Leeton. Um, and I know that because I lived there for a while. Um, and then they produced, uh, started to plant vines and produce wine from their own vineyards, which they started in 1972. The winemaker is the, uh, is the current generation of the Fumara family, Robert Fumara, who won, who won the Ron Potter Scholarship at the Riverina College in, back in the day when, before it became Charles Sturt University. So the ducks of the course wins the Ron Potter Scholarship. And um, he, was, uh, he was a winemaker at the University Winery for a while, and then they established their own winery at Lily Pilly. And he's been making a very, very high quality wines at Lily Pilly ever since. Um, but he is most famous for his sweet wines. Um, this wine won the trophy last year for the best, best sweet wine at the Boutique Wine Awards, the 2020 Boutique Wine Awards. It also it won two trophies at the same show. Um, the Riverina is so well suited to this style of wine because although it's a hot and dry region, it has a, the big irrigation scheme there, the Murrumbidgee Irrigation Scheme and the network of canals and, and channels of water running through the vineyard, uh, through the region raises the humidity level, especially in the autumn. So in the autumn, they get a lot of uh, fog and dew and, 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 and humidity is high. And those are the perfect conditions for the development of the Botrytis cinerea mold, which attacks the grapes and shrivels them, concentrating the sweetness and flavor and making it possible to produce a great wine like this. Let's have a quick taste. Um, 2018 Sauvignon Blanc. The first thing you notice is that gorgeous color. Botrytis tends to speed up the aging of the wine's color. It won't speed up the other things about the wine. So it's the, the wine will last for a long, long time and get darker and darker in color, but still tastes fantastic for a long time. So the nose is beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. It's got such an array of lemon peel, citron, dried mixed peels, honey, barley sugar, marmalade, all of those things you can detect in this wine. Very typical Botrytis affected wine. It doesn't smell as Sauvignon Blanc. So if you're a Sauvignon Blanc hater, don't worry, you will not be able to smell Sauvignon Blanc in this wine. Um, the Botrytis tends to dominate the varietal character in this sort of wine. So it's a Botrytis wine first and foremost. Mm. That is a beautiful wine. Very sweet, very unctuous on the palate, but it has lots of acidity, which keeps it fresh, keeps it lively, keeps it energized. That's a gorgeous wine. Incredibly long flavor. It goes on and on and on. It is, it is very sweet. So you only need a small amount of that wine at the end of a meal, even if you're having it with a, with a dessert. Or with cheese, even better. Um, and the, the, because the flavour stays with you for so long, it is, um, it's one of the great wines of Australia, really. We scored that 97 out of 100. So that's the granddaddy of tonight's offering. It's the highest scoring wine here. That's a very high gold ribbon score. It, was, it ranked number one out of 21 of the 18 vintage Sauvignon Blancs from New South Wales, but that's not, that's a little misleading because they weren't all sweet wines, but it is a top ranked wine. Um, we say drink it now until 2030. So it's got quite a long time to go. Another nine years, no problem. I don't think that will harm this wine at all. But I don't see any reason for keeping it because it's such an exquisite drink right now. We asked winemaker Robert Fumara what to serve with it and he said lime brulee, fresh lime brulee. Well, I totally agree that creme brulee would be perfect with this wine. I've never had a lime brulee, but I'll take your word for it, Robert. Um, I'm sure any brulee would go beautifully with that. And the lime, if it is, you've got lime in the brulee, it would, would, would chime with the citrus characters that are in this wine. We're running out of time. So a quick, quick question before we finish. Um, Joe B has says something smoky character is something. Mm -hmm. Why is it something you want to go away? I won't tackle that one. It's just the, 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 um, 
The Tatini wine, I recommended decanting and aeration because it's got a bit of a sulfide note to it. But um, a lot of wines have a bit of that character and it tends to breathe off. Um, most people won't even notice it and they won't care if they don't notice it. But if you do, the way to get rid of that, if you don't want it, is to decant the wine a couple of times and aerate it. It's a sulfide. Um, and Craig Tookie says, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly. When you finish this webinar, what is the first glass of wine you will pour yourself from the lineup? Well, someone asked me before what was the best wine there, and I said this one, but that's not the first wine I'm going to pour because it's a sweet wine. So I won't have that until a bit later. But definitely, I'm going to demolish some of these wines with dinner tonight. And the first one that I demolish will be the, um, the Semion, the Thomas Semion, just because I'm a bit of a Semion lover. And it's the most delicate wine, and you usually start with the most delicate wine and build up. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to have some of all of them, frankly, but uh, that's probably the first one I'll have. But I'll have a good glass of water before I have it after that sweet wine. So I hope you're convinced that New South Wales produces a great variety of wine styles, great varieties from a great variety of regions. It really is, I think. Um, uh, it tends to be a little overlooked in favour of, say, Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria, especially on the fancy wine lists of the fancy restaurants. And I apologise to, to, uh, to some Elias who might be listening. But really, if you're in New South Wales, you need to drink New South Wales wines. If you go to Italy, if you go to um, Tuscany, you want to drink Tuscan wine. If you go to Burgundy, you want to drink Burgundy wine. If you go to Alsace, you want to drink Alsace wine. If you come to New South Wales, you should drink New South Wales wine or at least have the opportunity of buying it when you go to a restaurant. Anyway, that's enough for me. I'm on, on my high horse. Thank you very much for joining me. And um, I should say what the next thing we're going to do is next week we're doing best wines of Western Australia. So I'm going to be a traitor and go across the WA from New South Wales. Um, and we're going to, the, the, the showpiece wine of that tasting will be Cullen's Diana Madeline, which is, I shouldn't really single wine out, but that's going to be something spectacular. Um, and we do say that you can go to our Cellador Direct uh, facility on our website if you want to order any of the wines direct from the winery. We don't sell wine. We don't even take a cut of it. We just give you the facility where you can order direct from the winery if you want to buy it just to make it easier. So Thursday, March the 11th, West Australian Wines is the next one. So thank you for joining me and thank you for your questions. And that's me over and out. Good night.